to preempt the genetic modification control. There always is an attempt. So people are watching this, and all that we do, lo and behold, one day they might say, it's illegal. You preempt it. The other issue they might bring up one day, we're always afraid, is stop talking about this. This is a national security issue. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. After 9-11, we had these talks for Homeland Security. And these guys came in from Texas, and they talked about food security. And this guy from Texas, he kind of looked like Dick Cheney, so I kind of treated him like Dick Cheney. He said, he said, monocrops, GMOs, are the most dangerous thing of all. And I thought, hey, that's useful if I quote him. So after the conference, I went up kind of innocently, and I said, can I quote you? He goes, yeah, sure. Monocropping GMOs are very dangerous. When you get wiped out, you get wiped out. Now, I thought that was understood, but to hear him say that. So I said, well, so you'll speak against them here on the islands. He said, you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? We want the enemy to have it, Iran and China, so you never have to invade them. You just say, I'll turn off your seed, or your seed might time bomb in three years. We want them to have it, but not us. And so I said, well, then why do we have it? I mean, we have it because we're sending them the seed. He said, well, you kind of got to show that we have to have it so that they can think it's good for them to have it. It's like, whoa, I have like no idea. And that's when I decided, forget the politics, just do the science as I was raised. I went to high school here. Um, I went to Princeton University. After four years of mathematics, physics, and chemistry, I graduated with honors in chemistry. I did my medical school in Tulane in New Orleans. I have a master's in tropical medicine. After that, I spent <clears throat> 24 years overseas with the Walter Reed Institute of Research and the World Health Organization. My job was to test drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics against tropical diseases. In the year 2000, after 24 years overseas, we decided to come back because my parents were old, and I came back and I saw this problem here. So let's just get going here. Okay, the title of this talk, and it's the same title in Arizona, GMOs, Genetically Modified Organisms, Are We Gambling With Our Future? And it's a trick question because the answer definitely is no. And people say, wait, stop, whose side are you on? I can guarantee you, as you define gambling, we are not gambling with our future. Okay, here we go. And this is how I define gambling. You know, you play roulette. When you play roulette, you know how many black squares, you know how many red squares, and there's two greens. So you know the chance of losing, you know the chance of winning. And the chance of losing is always a little bit greater because there's the equal number of black and two greens. Okay? But you know the odds of winning and losing. Okay, so that's how I define gambling. Let's talk basically what is genetic modification. Now, um, you remember, feel free to move around if you, or if you want to play with the lights. But, okay, it, genetic engineering, it's almost, that they use the terms interchangeably, GE, genetic engineering, or GMO, genetically modified organism. So they try to engineer. This is the ideal situation. This is what they want to do, their intention. So basically, they take the host, let's say it's a tomato. The tomato has a genome. The genome is the sum of all the genes linked together. For example, humans have 33,000 genes, and it's forever increasing because some of those pieces were called junk DNA, and we said, well, those aren't genes. And people said, yes, they are genes. But very interesting. Every day we learn that those junk DNA, genes or not, are sometimes more important than the gene. But all the genes strung together are your genome, and that's your DNA. So all you really want to do is take the gene from a foreign organism, like the fish, and you stick it in the, the gene of a tomato. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Arizona guys call it tomato, but whatever, <laughs> probably not. Okay, so you're gonna stick the thing in. Here it is, it's stuck in. And the gene is read by the RNA 
I know that's hard to read, but it's red and makes a protein. The protein is what makes you you. The DNA is a blueprint, but the protein expresses the gene. And so, for example, uh, I, can't, I can't remember, like blue eye or something. There's about six genes that control that. The length of your eyelash, there's a gene signal that fix that. I mean, how come your eyelashes don't grow this long? Yeah. Normal people. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> your eyebrow, your eyebrow, sorry. <laughs> All right, so that's how it's called. The gene is expressed in the protein. But what's this blue and what's that green thing? Well, if you're going to put the gene in, you gotta turn it on. 98% of our 33,000 genes are quiet at any one time. So some are on when you're three years old, only when you're three. Some are on when you're 75, only when you're 75. And God help you if you get the signal switch. So sometimes we see little kids, they prematurely age because they turn the gene on at the wrong time. Some genes, uncle genes, uncle is cancer. Then you have the gene to make leukemia, cancers, and not just one of them, they're probably 10 leukemia genes. If you turn those on, you get leukemia, okay? So they're silent, and it's orchestrated turning on at the right time. But if you're gonna put the red gene from the fish into the tomato, for all that trouble, you wanna turn it on. That's the green thing, it's called the promoter. The promoter is like an on switch, okay? Then there's a blue piece called the marker. When you put this thing in, you wanna know if it got there. Well, what's the problem? Because the way you put it in, how do you actually put this thing in? You get a petri dish of all this DNA material from the tomato. Then you get your little construct, the promoter, the marker, and the gene. You coat metal, you put it in a 22 shotgun thing, and you blast it into this plate, this receptive plate of cells with the DNA. And if it goes in, then the whole thing is turned on, and it starts to make the protein marker that I didn't draw. The protein marker is how you screen it to say, we got it, we got success. If it doesn't get in, you don't make the marker. And so that's how you blast away with the marker. And that's how it's supposed to work. That's the ideal situation. But how does it work? When you take a construct and you blast it away, it is true, sometimes there's a virus that can carry it. It's either virus or shotgun. Uh, <laughs> Kind of same effect. Look at this, you blast it away, and look what happened to your construct. Hey, there's a free promoter. Hey, there's a free uh, marker. Oh, that thing's in the wrong place. Oh, that thing is sitting on a gene or broke the gene. What, what's going on? Look at this, here's the other one next to it because you blast it in a plate full of dishes, a plate full of cells. Look, see those promoters? By convention, as they turn on, they're all on switches, turning on the things downstream or to the right. I made it turn on this little blue thing. That blue protein is supposed to be silent. Maybe that's your oncogene, cancer. Maybe that's supposed to turn on when you're 75 or three. Whatever, you turned it on. Do you know what you turned on? Well look, here's a successful piece right there. Isn't that good enough? Yeah, that was good. But what about all this other weird stuff? Look at that, there's a free gene here bridging the gap with no promoter, I guess that's silent. It's a mess, okay? Furthermore, I was wrong to draw the genome like a line. It really is a three-dimensional twisted turn. I, I do it like a mumble jumble, but it is quite organized. It's called flip in, flip out, drive, torsions. And why is that important? Because when it folds on itself and you try to read read the frame, sometimes you read cross bridge. It's called the shifting frame. And so if there's one thing we learned in the last 10 years, it's how little we learn, we know about genetics and genome. Now, the scientists, what they call the scientists, but you should know how little you know, and that has been shown in the last 10 years. When I went through school, the idea was one gene makes one protein. If you put anything else, you got F. That was so basic, you got it half. Now we know in the humans, we have 33,000 genes. It makes 100,000 proteins. So on the average, how can one gene make three proteins? I thought you said it reads it down the line. Well, it reads it crosswise. 
the frame can shift. It can read this part and continue on. Now that's stupendous. We went from one gene, one protein to one gene, three proteins. Furthermore, there's tons of material in between that we had no idea what we were doing, and we call it junk. Turns out to be the orchestrators. It's called the RNA series. Never mind if you can't read it, okay? That's one thing. One gene doesn't make one protein. The next thing we learn is a lot of our genes are shared amongst the plant and animal kingdom. Yeah. Whoa, you mean, you mean my area is malaria. The malaria parasite shares a gene that makes a pump, that pumps out drugs. So every time you try to poison the malaria parasite, it's resistant because the drug pumps it out. Guess what? That pump, that gene for that pump is in my liver. That's how my liver detoxifies it. How in the world did I get the same gene as the malaria parasite? Do you think we have common ancestors that had sex? No. That's a tantalizing thought. What really is true is that there are gene exchanges through the viruses. The viruses go into an animal, it hijacks and it incorporates itself in the genome, takes it over, then moves out and infects another species, and it will share the genes. If that gene is useful, like this pump, to detoxify your liver, to detoxify the malaria pump, if it's useful, we can retain it. If it's not useful, and our ancestors that paid the price, in history of mankind, I guarantee you, viruses brought us some pretty weird, useless stuff. Well, that lineage of people died out. We have paid the price. Remember that. You are who you are, kind of adapted to this environment because your ancestors paid the price, okay? Now, one more interesting thing we always learn. So some genes are silent and they shouldn't be turned on. We share a lot of genes and then there's this one gene making three proteins. Those silent areas, they used to call junk DNA. We are learning that they are the orchestrators. And I want you to remember, this is very good, sometimes the analogy is kind of infantile, but you can remember it best this way. You have a gene from the fish, you put it in the tomato, okay? That's like taking the tuba, I, I was in the band, in the high school band. That's like taking the tuba player, I, I didn't play the tuba, I played the trumpet. That's like taking the tuba player and throwing him in the football team in the middle of the game. First of all, the tuba player, when he lands in the football team, I guess he knocked out the quarterback. Okay, fine, can't help that. Next, the tuba player, the on switch promoter, is always on. So he's playing and he tells him, shut up, we're trying to play the game. But he's always on and there's no orchestration, okay? And the final thing is right here, right here. These genes that don't belong there, they're from other species, they're called promiscuous. They either move out, because the tuba player doesn't belong in the football team, and they push him to the girls' volleyball team, and he's happily playing the tuba, being disruptive. These are called promiscuous genes. Genes that don't belong there move out, or they amplify. In other words, one copy, oh, there's one. The next time it replicates is 2, 4, 8, 16. So amplification, amplification. That was my area of research. There was one poor worm. We gave him a foreign gene, and after seven generations, I think 56% 56, 56 of his gene was that gene. What do you think he's doing, making tons of useless protein? This has to do with GMO crops, doesn't it? You put in a construct that forever is producing that red thing. You're not supposed to turn it on all the time. You're supposed to turn it on when you need it. That's about epigenetics. So you made it so it's always on. That's wasteful. And when you do wasteful stuff, you are attacked by the other microbes, the viruses, the parasites, the fungus. You forever weaken the other areas. That's like a guy who's so obsessed with football that he can't cross the street. That is the why. Gene, GMOs are almost synonymous with sterilizing the fields so that they cannot be attacked by the other microbes. Now, we learned this, and they learned this too, because it wasn't supposed to be like that. But that's why the suit is in Kauai. 
the amount of pesticides they use. You think sugarcane, you think pineapple is bad. You should see what they're doing in the GM fields. We